Amen. All right, turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2 is where we're going to kind of start off. Raise your hands. If you, if you don't have one of these chapel outlines, raise your hand and Paulius would love to give you one. So if you have one, if you don't have one, raise your hand. All right. Romans chapter 2 is where we're going to start off. Now, ninth and 10th grade, you guys all know, you guys know all about the book of Romans, right? You guys just had a test on it. And we said in this test that in, in Romans chapters 1 and 2, Paul kind of, or, or 1, 2, and 3, Paul kind of sets his attack on three different groups of people. Who were they? Moralist, heathen, and even the Jew. And so, you can go to the next slide. In Romans chapter 1, we see Paul going against the heathen. He's condemning all of these people who are obviously so sinful. These are people, um, if, if you looked at Romans 1 at the end, they are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit. They're gossips. They're uh, doing sexually immoral sins. These are people that are clearly sinful human beings. They are filled with every sort of wicked, evil thing that we can think of. And it's easy to look at them and say, yeah, how wicked they are. But, when we get to Romans chapter 2, Paul kind of switches gears a bit. Have you ever heard the expression, preaching at the choir? That's when you're, you're preaching to people um, who, who kind of agree with you, and they, 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 they're cheering you on, and that's great until... Paul kind of turns it around on them. And in Romans 2, we go to the next slide, he says this, Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on one another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God falls rightly on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things, and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? We go to the next slide. Paul is preaching to the choir in chapter 1. He's talking about all these wicked, horrible, sinful people, and he's writing to a church. And so these Christians are probably, they're right on board with Paul. Yeah, that's right, Paul. Preach it. That, that's, that's, that's great. But then he says, well, what about you? He talks about the sin of hypocrisy. We have a problem with hypocrisy, don't we? As, as Christians, we ought to, right? Hypocrisy is a horrible sin. It's definitely, clearly a sin. It's probably the number one sin that Christian organizations are accused of. There's probably not a church in America that has not been called just a place where all these hypocrites are. I don't go to church because they're just a bunch of hypocrites. And the fact of the matter is they're right. Christian schools. Probably the number one accusation I've heard against Christian schools is, well, they're a bunch of hypocrites. In they claim to be Christian, but they really don't live like it. And that's all Christians because you're forced to be uh, to behave in a certain way, you're forced to go to church. You're forced, so you're just really creating a whole bunch of hypocrites. And the sad fact of the matter is, we have a lot of hypocrites, don't we? In this room. And I know you agree with me, because I was looking over those, remember the, the spiritual emphasis week surveys that you guys filled out? I think that was like almost the top of the list of problems you, you see in our school. Hypocrisy. And instead of waiting until spiritual office this week, I decided, let's just do it now. Let's just, I, I just felt like God said, you know, let, let's just get that out of the open. 
And so this morning, we're going to be talking about hypocrisy. But I want to do it in a little bit of a different way. Let's go to the next slide. Because when we look at what Paul is actually talking about, he's not talking about hypocrisy in the way that we typically think of. We think of a hypocrite in, in the context of what we just talked about, in the context of our, of our school. Even. A hypocrite is someone who says they are one thing, but they do another. Oh, you say you're a Christian, but then you treat other people like garbage later. Oh, you say you're a small group leader, but then you're a jerk leader. Oh, you say that you're a Christian, you go to church, but I just heard you cursing. Oh, you say you're a Christian, but you don't even sing in chapel. And that's a problem. But that's not the problem that Paul is addressing. Paul is addressing the people who are judging others. He's not just saying, okay, yeah, you people say you're one thing, but you do another. He says, you are judging all these people for their sin, but you're doing the same thing. You're, you're so focused on everyone else's sin, but you're not talking about your own sin. It's a different aspect of hypocrisy, isn't it? And, and that's what I want to address here. Now, um, Let's go to the next screen. The reality of the situation is, like I said, we're hypocrites. We are. Uh, the reality of the situation is oftentimes the true hypocrites are often the ones calling everyone else a hypocrite. Let that sink in for a second. Oftentimes, not all the time, but oftentimes, the person who is labeling that uh, everyone else they meet a hypocrite because they don't, they're not marching up to or lining up with everyone else's standards. Oftentimes they are hypocritical themselves. The fact of the matter is, Christians in general, we are all hypocrites. Why? We subscribe to the gospel of Christ. We read the Bible and we see what God has for us to do. But the problem is, we are Christians, but we are sinners. We are saint and sinner at the same time. While we try to live out the Christian life as much as we can, we are sinners who fall short of the glory of God. The fact of the matter is, we're all a bunch of hypocrites. Some more, some less, but we're all there. That's the reality. Sometimes we have this idea that our churches or our schools should be this pristine area, this sin-free zone that is completely pure. And where no sin ever takes place. That's a reality that's never going to happen this time of heaven. I have up here the phrase, embrace the ugly. Don't want you to hug Tim or something. I'm talking about <laughs> accepting the fact we're ugly. We are stained with sin. Accept it. Recognize it. I think it's a better word than saying accept it. Recognize it. Realize we're sinful creatures. We're not going to get to that point of complete sin, sinless perfection. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen at this school. There are going to be people at this school who curse. You shouldn't. But some of you will. There are going to be people here at this school who are hypocrites. I don't want you to be, but you're going to be. Including me. There are people at this school who are going to lie, who are going to cheat. Or it's going to happen. We want it to happen as the uh, least amount of times as possible, but it's going to happen because we're dealing with human beings. We're dealing with people who are not perfect. And we don't want to just accept it, but we don't want to go to the opposite extreme and just say, well, you guys can't be Christians. Cheating would never happen in a Christian school. Swearing would never happen in a Christian school or a Christian church. It does, and it will, and it will continue to happen. We have to accept that and realize it. That doesn't mean we have to be happy with it and keep it the way it is, but we have to realize that's a reality. I don't ever want to concern 
or condone sin. But all sin has to be addressed. The sin of those people who are doing those horrible things, like in Romans 1, but also the sin of the people who are always accusing and judging those people in Romans 1. Their sin has to be addressed as well. So let's go to the next, the next slide. John 8, 3 through 11. Turn there real quick in your Bibles. It's a familiar story. John chapter 8, and let's pick up the story in verse 3. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Jesus, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Yes. Not that so. Thank you. Now in the law of Moses, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? They said this to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at him. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman, standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. So here's Jesus in a tricky situation. The scribes and the Pharisees have brought this woman who is obviously a sinful person. She has been caught in the act of adultery. A horrible sin that breaks apart a marriage, a union that God himself has brought together under a covenant, loving relationship. It's a picture of Jesus and the church. Our relationship with Christ is pictured in this, and this act of adultery has ripped this apart. It's a horrible sin. But what was Jesus' response? They're saying, stoner, killer. And Jesus says, well, if you're without sin, you can go ahead and cast the first stone. Let's go to the next slide. Sexual sin is condemned. It's, it's an obvious sin. It's in the Ten Commandments. It was right to address the sin. The Pharisees and scribes, what they said was right. And Jesus makes sure to mention this was sin. The very last thing he says to her is, don't sin anymore. He didn't just let her off. He called it what it is, sin. Let's go to the next slide. So what's the difference between Jesus and these Pharisees? The simple word is grace. That's the difference. These guys are more concerned about killing a woman than saving her. They're more concerned about revenge. She's done something wrong. Let's get her. Jesus is more concerned about this woman. You see the difference? It's easy to talk about all the hypocrites that we see because their sin is so obvious. It's another thing to say, you know what? I'm concerned about this person. I'm concerned about my friend. I'm concerned about it. I want them to have the same relationship with Christ that I do. And I'm concerned about where this sin is taking them and leading them, how they're being deceived, how they are being tricked by Satan into thinking that these sinful activities are fun or enjoyable. Man, I, I wish they could know the love that I have with Christ. And that There's a difference between those two, aren't there? Which one is Christian? Which one is following the pattern of Christ? And which one is following, following the pattern of these Pharisees, who Jesus himself calls them hypocritical? The accusers wanted to make sure their moral uprightness was recognized. Their moral superiority was there. She committed adultery. We are the ones who are bringing up the scripture. We are the ones who want to... Their problem is two things. First, they're arrogant. 
They showed no concern for this woman. That's the second one. There's no love. There's no tears. There's no concern whatsoever for this woman at all. They just want to say that she gets punished. Because she's not as good as we are. She's not living all the, by the same standards we are. And their standards are right. You shouldn't commit adultery. It is a sin. So the next slide. So then how do we treat these people? How are we in this situation? We are those, most of us in this room, are in that area, just by this survey I, you know, we, we did, are in the area of we're looking and we're, we're calling out the hypocrites. We're there. We want to sometimes make ourselves look good by amplifying the sins of other people. Look at what they did. I don't swear like those guys do. I don't. I go to church and I sing in chapel and I do all this stuff. But they're doing this. They're not. They say they're a Christian and I say I'm a Christian. But I'm doing it. And I'm doing all this. They're not doing all that. Sometimes this is an issue of simple arrogance. We're ignoring our own sins, pride, self-centeredness. Not loving those around us. Let's go to the next thing. So I want to talk about some things. But do we, do we let these guys off the hook? I want to talk about how to address this. Do we, look, do we just say, okay, you know what? There are hypocrites in the school. Let's just deal with it. We're good. I'll just accept it. No. We don't want to. That's not a loving thing to do. Loving someone is not letting them continue in their sin. Galatians 6, 2, uh, 6 1 and 2. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, any transgression, sin, you who are spiritual, you've noticed sin and you're trying to do what's right yourself, should restore him in a, gen in a spirit of gentleness, not of pride, condemnation, attack. Keep watch on yourself, you who are spiritual, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens. If there are hypocrites in this room, and there are, we need to bear that burden on ourselves. It should bother us if there are people who are living a life that is contradictory to the statements that they make. But not bother us just in this holy outrage. Because we can brag all that, oh, they're a hypocrite, they're not like me, they're, they're a bunch of hypocrites. That doesn't do anything, does it? Does that solve the problem? No, it doesn't. What solves the problem is I've got to go to somebody, and I've got to do something about this. I've got to bear that burden. That's what fellowship is all about. That's what Christian community is all about. That's what we want to promote here at our school. It's not just enough to be outraged against sin. Though we ought to be, and that's good. But we got to take that to the next level. So, eight principles here. Let's go to the next slide. Eight principles. I'm trying to go through this quickly. We've got like five minutes. I think we can do it. As you guys know, I'm very, I'm not very long-winded at all. I'm, I can pretty much get right to the point. That last, what you're talking about, the very, very thing that you're talking about is convicting me right now. So, as a teacher, I need to be one of the first to stand up and say, you know what, I dealt with a student that wasn't very gentle today. So, to that student, I apologize. You know who you are. And so, I'm making a public apology that I did not treat you gently with this issue that we have today. So, um, And that's so easy for us as teachers to do, isn't it? Yeah. Because you guys are wrong. And you guys take us off quite a bit. Um, but this applies to us as well. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Donald. Number one, we cannot simply ignore the sins of those we love, those who God has placed in our sphere of influence, which is our school right here. It's not loving just to ignore it, even out of arrogance or out of uh, apathy. Either one, not good. Our goal in confrontation is not condemnation, that's God's job. God will condemn people to hell. God will judge people. That's not good. 
But reconciliation. Back in the book of Matthew, you can see this whole pattern God has for church discipline. If someone offends you, go and talk to them privately. If he doesn't, then you need to take some witnesses with you, and eventually you're going to take it before the church. But Jesus says the goal here is to win back your brother. It's not just to kick people out of a church or out of a school. Sometimes I get upset if I say, you know, I don't know why this student is still here. He's done this, he's done this, he's done this. And sometimes God has to get a hold of my heart and say, you know what? Maybe that needs to happen. Maybe someone needs to be expelled. But our goal is not to kick people out. Our goal is to receive them back. To bring our friends back in the right relationship with God and with others, that has to be there. Number three, our motivation must be love. It is not loving to allow people to continue in harmful sin, and all sin is harmful. It's not loving only to complain, and not to confront. Our motivation is love. Not just pride, not just arrogance, not just, well, he's, it's love. Let's go to the next one. Number four. We must always remember that we too are sinners worthy of the wrath of God. Number five. We must always preach the gospel, even after we're saved. Christ died for sinful man unworthy of his love. We are all in that category. God can work in the hardest of hearts. And we have to remember, we're justified by faith, not by our works, not especially by the works that other people see. God can be working in lives that we don't know about. You look at the example of Lot in the Old Testament. Lot was a sinful, wicked person in the Old Testament. You don't see anything really positive about Lot. But then you see in the New Testament that we see Lot being called righteous. His righteous soul was vexed within him when he was in Sodom. God was working in this guy's life, though it might not have been obvious at the time. There are some of you who might be as sinful as whatever. But God has begun working in your heart. Number seven, patience is required. All right, skip over some. Number six, realize that everyone is, uh, is different, on a different level of sanctification. We're not all on the same level. Some people are, uh, are just not as advanced in the faith as you may be. They don't have a background in church. They've never had good, real Bible preaching. Some are just not, they've not been saved for a long time. This is all new. And for some, there are, they claim to be saved, but they're actually not. That's hard to, con- it's hard to try to get someone who's not saved to act like they are. And they're going to struggle with them. Number seven is patience is required. It's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to be a matter of, okay, I see my friend Lance, sinful, horrible as he is, and I want to talk to him, and I want to share with him some helpful verses of Scripture, and I want to show that I love him, and I care about him, and I don't like the direction you're going. Lance may not drop to his knees and beg forgiveness at that very moment. It's going to require patience. Some sins are just tough. They're hard. They're addictive. They're not going to be solved just like that. It may take years. Um, Last one here, number eight. We ought to show grace and love. Sinners sin. It's what we do. Sometimes we just need to recognize it. Sometimes we're we're never going to be perfect. Sometimes we just have to give someone a break. And that's a matter of wisdom to know when to do that and when not to do that. Even if they don't deserve it, that's grace. I need it from time to time, and you do too. Lord Jesus, we thank you for our our Savior, Jesus, and the grace and love he showed toward us. He could have condemned us at the very first sin we ever committed. But he is long-suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Give us that same desire. Give us that same burden. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, quickly, you can go to small groups, put away your chairs, and we're done.